Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective who's been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Dateline, and Court TV. Now, we join him as he applies his investigative skills to making a case for Christianity. Well, thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. I'm Jay Warner Wallace, and today we have as a special guest, uh, Jeff Myers, my boss, actually, at Summit Worldview Ministries, where Jeff is the president of Summit Worldview Ministries, and that's a, a ministry that does immer- a ton of stuff, but one of the most important things it does is it provides an immersive experience for high school students, several sessions every year across the country, but centered in Manitou Springs, Colorado, where we give students two weeks to really absorb the, 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 the truth of the Christian worldview in every angle you could possibly look at it, really blending information and truth with relationships, which are built deeply in those two weeks, which make all the difference to students. Now, Summit also does curriculum, and Jeff's been really pivotal in that as well, because his work is really deep, and he's got a new book. I want to talk about it with you, Jeff. Thanks for joining Jim, I'm really glad, and I'm so grateful that you spend so much time with our students at Summit Ministries. They love your presentations. They especially love the Q&A, where you just stand up and say, hey, any questions you got? Yeah, and most of the time, as you know, when we're talking, we don't even cover the stuff we covered in class. Most of the time, we're covering the things of life. And this is what's so great about your new book. It's called Truth Changes Everything. And it really does, and it has the truth of Christianity has changed everything historically in the common era. And, and what's great about your book is it's not just kind of a, a citation of the ways that truth can change everything, but it's actually a call to action by showing how people, this is a subtitle, how people of faith can transform the world in times of crisis. And wow, if there ever, ever was a time when we might say we're in a time of crisis, it, it probably is right now. So here's what I want to ask you first. And I, I write books as well. And, and I think that most of us write books. And why? Why do we write? Do we write just because we have another book due? Or is there something about the world that you saw that you said, no, no, now is the time for this book in this generation? What was it you were seeing that prompted you to write this book? Well, it's what I was seeing, Jim, but it's also what I was going through. I had been diagnosed with cancer. And I wondered whether I would make it. Uh, Of course, the doctors were saying, if we treat this very aggressively, we think you have a very good chance of making it. But you still wonder, if I write, if I only have one more thing to write, what would I say? If this is my last book, what would it be? You know, know, we asked that question, but the Apostle Paul must have asked that. I may have only one letter left to Timothy. What should I say? What's my last lecture? So in the middle of that, I decided the most important thing that I can be standing for right now is truth. Because we have a battle right now between truth, capital T, the idea that truth really exists and we should seek it, and truths, small t, the truth doesn't exist, at least not in a way that we could know. So all we have are our social, uh, social, socially constructed experiences. No culture that has ever moved toward that second view has ever survived unless they turned away from it. And that's where we are right now. We've passed the tipping point where a majority of people now say they believe truth is up to the individual. So I felt like if this is the only thing I could ever write, this is what I would write on. Yeah, and I love the way you, you use that expression of you know the capital T and the small t. This difference. Now, it, it, the first couple of chapters of your book, you really kind of drill down into this notion of truth, set the foundation for why this is so important. But look, I've got listeners and viewers of our TV show who aren't necessarily as uh, proficient in all of the, the ways that apologists typically address this issue. So when you yeah. say tap, capital T and lowercase t, I think I understand what you're saying. But just help people who maybe aren't familiar with this. This is the entire shift. John Cooper wrote, who's, who's the lead singer at Skillet, he wrote, an endorsement for your book and I think he correctly says that this is really the cause of all the chaos is this misunderstanding about the nature of truth so just tell us a little bit by what you mean by why what the differences are and why they're so important well the truth means what really is and Jesus said in John 8 31 and 32 if you follow my teachings you will know the truth and the truth will set you free two important things to notice there first of all truth Greek The Greek word, aletheia, which doesn't mean anything to most people, but it actually means reality. So Jesus is not saying, hey, if you follow my teachings, you'll know your truth. You'll feel better about yourself. No, 
If you know, if you follow my teachings, you will know reality. Reality itself will open up to you. And that's what sets you free. You know from your law enforcement experience and also you and your wife, I know, do a lot of counseling and, and that's an important ministry. The first step in people regaining health, mental health especially, is to acknowledge reality. If you don't know what's real or you want to live in your fantasy world, you're never going to get better. Yeah, I thought it was interesting what you said about how every culture that has abandoned this concept of correspondent truth, that truth corresponds to what really is, to reality, um, has led themselves into destruction. And, and I think it's easy for us to say that, but some people might challenge us on that. So give us an example of how this kind of view, a smaller case T uh, of truth, uh, leads cultures to destruction. Well, Jim, when I was growing up, people would say, I think there is such a thing as truth. Or they might say, speak your truth, man. But what they meant by that is give your opinions and be bold about it. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what people mean these days. There's a crucial tipping point here that I don't think most people have recognized. When people say, speak your truth now, or there's no such thing as truth, what they mean is there's no real reality there is no difference between male and female. There is no difference between right and wrong. We cannot know which way we'd be forward or backward. There is nothing outside of our experience. Well, if that's mm, true, that's then we can't even use words, can we? Because words refer to things. We can't communicate anymore. We can't know what justice is because we have no idea what justice is beyond what we personally feel we mean when we're talking about justice. We can have no such thing as law because we don't any longer have any sense of what is right or wrong or how we ought to live in relationship to one another. Uh, it, uh, Will Durant, the great historian, said, no civilization has ever been conquered from without until it has destroyed itself from within. When you say that, Jeff, it just feels so um, ominous, right? Because, uh, look, I've got a lot of friends who are, have been Christians a lot longer than me. Uh, they maybe were Christians from the time they were very young. And they uh, are always very sensitive to prophecy and what end times prophecies. Like they're constantly looking around every dark corner and bush for the sign that we are at the end times. Um, and this idea that, that but look, forget about that for a second. You're saying that if there was no biblical history, if there was no Bible, we could still look at secular history and see that cultures that abandon truth, big T truth, um, you know, that this is how we collapse. And that's the thing that's the thing that's the most frightening, and people ought to be at least aware of this. And why I think your book is unique. Look, we've written books about truth. We, a lot of us have. A lot of the people on staff at at faculty at Summit have, and and you and I have both written books about the impact of Jesus on culture. But what I love is is that you've really in this book talked about how the truth of the of biblical truth has impacted not just some of the areas that I've looked at, but many of the areas that. This is exactly what Summit does. Summit looks at how Christian worldview impacts everything from economics to every aspect of human nature. And that's what I think is so unique about your book. Now, just tell me, why did you think that was the approach? Because, look, you could have written a book about truth and just made claims. There are folks out there who have done that. Here's the difference between the two kinds of truth. Here's how you can talk to your friends to help them understand that they are holding a self-refuting claim. I get all that. That's not the approach you took, though. Why did you think it would be important to tell people how... Uh, truth, the biblical truth, has impacted the world rather than just refute the notions of, of subjective truth claims we hear all the time. Jim, the breakthrough for me was recognizing truth does exist, and it's not just a set of logical propositions. It's not just a set of mathematical formulas that model the universe as we see it. It is a person. It's Jesus. Jesus is the truth. So I thought, what better way to illustrate that, if that's really true, than looking at the personal impact that Jesus' followers had in history, in science, the arts, education, politics, justice, the care for people, just the understanding of the value of human life, those basic areas. And some really amazing stories emerged out of this. Some of them have never been told that I'm aware of. I read a lot. Uh, you can kind of tell from my office here, but it... Yeah. It, yeah. uh, but some of these have never been told, but it's really important to recognize that every one of these stories came in a time of crisis when the world seemed to be at its end and people acted, not because they wanted to write on their college application, I want to change the world, 
but because they just wanted to be the very best Jesus followers they could be in science, in art, in education, and in all of these other areas of life. Now, before we take a break and go to those those issues, I just want to ask this one last question about the, your format of the book. So I thought that was interesting. The whole idea of crisis, right? So, so I I wrote a book, Person of Interest, about the impact of Jesus. But but this idea of focusing on times of crisis, why did you think that that was of particular uh, importance in terms of your approach and looking at the impact, rather than just saying, well, look, you know, crisis or no crisis, Jesus has had this impact here, 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 and here, and here. What is the crisis aspect that makes this so important to you? Well, by, by the way, I, I read Person of Interest while I was going through my cancer battle and while I was working on this book. It was such an encouragement to me. So thank you uh, for sending that, that manuscript along. I had to use a forest of paper to print it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that one. <laughs> so here, but I mean, you, so why, you, I'm, why? I was only yeah. responding to conversations I had had with you prior, Jeff. I mean, we have been talking about this impact, but I just didn't I think it. of it from the perspective of crisis. crisis. That's what I think is interesting. So tell me why you chose that. Well, we, we think that times of crisis cause, should cause us to sort of bury our heads. That's sort of the natural human response. I have students who've gotten out of college, gotten married, and we talk about, you know, children. And they would say... I don't know if we're going to have children because who could bring a child into a world like this? And I would tell them, yeah. hey, look, uh, you know, Will Durant studied 3,000 years of human history and only 268 years were at peace. If people in the past had said, I'm going to wait till everything is all peaceful and nice before I do anything, nothing good would have ever happened. Mm. The most important thing to do is look back in times of crisis. And, I, and Jim, in the book, I pick, as you, you remember, I pick the yeah. worst crisis probably to ever befall the entire world. A third to half of the people died in the, in the world. And yet, out of that time, people turned to God rather than away from him, and they changed the entire world, literally, economically, scientifically, in terms of charity and everything else. Yeah, great point. I think this is worth, and I just will say this, the, the, the first couple of chapters that really kind of deal with where we are right now in culture and what the, the deficits of truth are, are worth the price of admission. But what we're about to talk to after the, about, after the break, I think is the area that I kind of love so much too, because it's the, un, in some ways, I think it's unexpected the amount of impact that Jesus has had and that his followers have had and how they it's the nature of biblical truth claims that make all the difference. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll be discussing that. Be sure to visit the Cold Case Christianity website daily to read Jim's blog, watch the weekly video, or listen to the Cold Case Christianity podcast. You'll also find great free resources, including the free downloadable monthly Bible insert. While you're there, be sure to sign up for Jim's daily case note email. Cold Case Christianity is designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. In addition to Jim's daily blog and weekly podcasts and videos, Jim continues to write books designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. These resources will help you defend what you believe and share it with others. Okay, so here we are back with Jeff Myers uh, talking about the most important book that he's going to release this year. Like all of us who write books, I think when we write them, Jeff, we think that this is the most important book we've written, which we ought to believe that because that's the kind of energy we bring to the project. And you've now written a book called Truth Changes Everything. And we've been talking about the nature of big T truth and little t truth. But what I want to talk about now are the chapters you have, which I just loved because I, when I knew you were working on this project, and like a lot of times we don't, I, I did the same thing that happened to me with Frank Turek when I wrote God's Crime Scene. He was writing uh, Stealing from God. And it turns out that pretty much chapter by chapter, we were writing about the same topics from a different angle. And I thought, what are the odds of that, right? And kind of the same thing is happening here, because what you talk about are some things that I wanted to talk about, but the kind of evidential approach I was taking, I thought, kind of limited me. And you're talking about how Jesus' followers not only changed art and literature and, and uh, history, and I mean, uh, science and, and education, the things I also talk about, but I love your chapters on how it talks about how we value human life, um, how we care, and of course, that's closely attached to how we then care for each other. And also how you talk about the pursuit of justice and, how, and the impact on politics. 
these are two areas that I did not examine at all. And, and I love the fact that you took a deep dive there. So what I would like to do, uh, first of all, is talk about the, the approach. Why did you decide, like I had to make the same decision, what, what did you just, when you were looking at the scope of history, post-Jesus, what was it that, you, that it made your list? That, or how did you make your list? What, did you, did, what to include and what not to include? You know, Jim, sometimes we get so close to life that we don't really live it. I don't think about mm. the breath that I take. I just took a breath. Mm. That's a miracle. My heart kept beating throughout the last 12 minutes. That's really a miracle. Sometimes we get so close to it that we don't think about it. And people, that's, that's true about the faith. Very few people realize that if it weren't for biblical Christianity through its Judea, uh, Judaistic uh, heritage, through Judaism, if it had not been for that, we would not have the value of human life that we take for granted. Mm. People do not value human life in many parts of the world to this day. People, worldviews that don't start with the idea that human beings bear God's image don't value human life. So I started with, you know, some simple examples, but, you know, Thomas Aquinas, the philosopher, uh, nothing about him is really simple, but at the core of his whole philosophy is this idea that we have souls. We have, we have souls. We are, you know, we're continuous. I had my appendix out when I was a little kid. I was not any less Jeff without an appendix than I was before. I have this substance that is continuous, that makes sense, that, that persists through time. I, I have desires. And not only do I have desires, but I desire to have desires. I have purposings, all of those kinds of things. The Bible says, that all came from the idea that we bear God's image. That's right from the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And it, it actually transforms culture. One of the stories I tell in the book is about the Romans. So the Romans, you know, they didn't have any sense of human value. I, I, should, I shouldn't say it that way. If you were a majority culture property-owning male, you had value. If you weren't, you didn't. So they, if they had a, you know, if they had a little girl in a household, they're like, we already have a girl, you know, they just take the baby, take it by the leg, throw it out in the street. Uh, roll carts would roll over the body. Animals would, uh, would attack the, the body. Well, the Christians, because they believe that every human being, including unwanted little girls has value, would come through the streets and pick up all the little babies, then raise them as their own. When there was a demographic crisis in Rome, lots of young men grew up, but there weren't very many young women because they had thrown them all out into the street. They went looking for wives and found them at church. Rodney Stark, uh, who's the, who was recently passed away, was a history professor, called it secondary conversion. Because uh, I'd always heard Rome became Christian because the emperor demanded it. Truth is, it became Christian because people just did something super simple. They just treated every single person as if they had value as image bearers of God. Yeah, this is so interesting. Why is it you think, and this is what gets me, is that, you, first of all, you include, I love your storytelling. And so just as an aside, as, a, as an author, um, what is your process of, of collecting the kinds of, I mean, I, I sometimes will hear things, then I'll write them down and store them in a file in my Outlook, you know, I'll email them to myself and I'll store them. Because I'm thinking, I, I, that story is such a great illustration of X. And I'm not even thinking about writing X yet. I just have a bunch of these things stored in a file. Are you the same way where you're collecting these stories? Or is it the kind of thing where you, when you start to see a notion occur, you start looking for stories? What, what's, what's been your approach, just uh, as an aside? You know, as an author, I, I, do, I kind of do it both ways. If I'm thinking about writing a book, I'll imagine what are the 12 or 13 topics that would need to be covered for that book to be complete, and I'll make a file folder for each one of those chapters. That's right. When I come across an illustration, I just drop it in the file folder. I've got file folders in my closet for books that I might never write, but I'm always yeah. collecting illustrations for them. And, and some of these stories, they're, they're so amazing because they're, they're talking about amazing people, I, I had to actually go back and ask, is this really true? Did this really happen? Because this is almost too good to be true. But it is true. Yeah, yeah. You know, for example, in science, you, and you studied science a lot in person of interest, and the results are absolutely remarkable. I mean, if you hadn't seen all the evidence, you wouldn't believe no. it. But no. of the 52 individuals whose inventions and discoveries are credited with the founding of modern science, only one of them was an atheist. I never heard that in a science class or a history class or anywhere else. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, let me ask you this question then. So why do you think it is then? And I ask this, well, I think I know why, but, but I think it's a lot of young Christians who are raised in the church, who, who will come to some of the Worldview Conference, who honestly, if, if they were to stop and think, they've, they've never heard this. I mean, Christian or otherwise, this is not being taught in secular uh, schools. It certainly isn't being taught in the academy. Is it, do you think it, I don't want to give you, I'm not a conspiracy theorist guy, but, but I mean, I, I know that people will say, well, this, there's an act of suppression of truth related to the impact of Christianity on culture. And that's why I think books like yours and I will have an impact. I'm really more concerned that non-Christians might be involved in reading these than Christians, because I think that no one's teaching this history. Why do you, you don't think it's an act of, or, or do you think there is a bit of an active effort to suppress the impact that's known about how Christianity has impacted culture? I like to try to give people the benefit of the doubt. I had a friend who got a green Volvo, and he said, I got the green Volvo because I knew nobody else had a green Volvo. And guess what he noticed everywhere he went? Green Volvos. <laughs> so we tend to pay attention to the things that we pay attention to. If right. your worldview says there is no God, you have to make up all of meaning and purpose for yourself, you tend to interpret everything through that framework. So the fact that some of these stories have never been told is probably more revealing of people's lack of a biblical worldview than it is in their desire to um, conspiratorially uh, destroy a biblical worldview. Uh, and it's a fine line, I have to say. You know, the Apostle Paul, he didn't, he didn't create nuances about that. He said, there are people out there whose desire is to destroy the truth. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, uh, last thing I want to talk to you about, and I, I've noticed, I'm just getting ready to write about this in the next book, because I noticed this in counseling, and I see this in, your, in the impact in your book, and maybe you can speak to this. Uh, when, when people suffer a trauma, so let's say this is your timeline from birth, and you're going along, and then you suffer this mm -hmm. trauma, and it seems like for a season it's really hard to kind of get back to where you were. This idea of resiliency in your mental health, in your relationships, you've been involved in some crisis, a shooting, if you're a police officer, that kind of thing. And then you have, like, a, if you stay there too long in that depressed state, you're kind of what they call PTSD, these kinds of things. But, but And so our goal sometimes in counseling is to get people back to where they were. We call that resiliency. But I've, we've discovered that if you can do a certain thing, you can not only get back to where you were, but you can do better than that. You can actually flourish on the back side of a crisis. And, and typically, it's what is called meaning-making. It's those people who have the ability to make some sense of what it is they've just experienced. Even the trauma that they just experienced could somehow see that there's something good on the backside that would not have been available to them unless they had suffered the trauma. Those, those folks end up thriving on the backside of trauma. Hmm. And as I'm reading how Jesus followers changed in this list, and you have to get the book to see the list. What I love about your book, too, is that it's not, um, it's accessible. In other words, this is a lot of stuff that we're talking about. Any one of these chapters in, in Person of Interest and in your book could have been a book on its, on its own. But you've condensed them down into chapters. But how do you see then that the truth that's offered by a biblical worldview, by Jesus and his followers, and the way it impacts the world, also helps us to make sense of the world? And I, I look at this and I think, wow, it does help us to make sense. You cannot think about politics unless you have some sense of the world. So can you just, for, I know this is kind of off topic a little bit, but can you make just a, a little bit about how that might be the case, that we can actually flourish once we know what, how biblical truth changes things? Well, Jim, I've noticed a lot of people who've gone through trauma become more fragile. And I've seen others who've become more resilient. They've overcome that fragility. And I've often wondered why that's the case. Uh, one of the things I looked at in this in the book, Truth Changes Everything, is this time of crisis in which possibly uh, up to half of the people, especially in Europe, uh, died in the most gruesome imaginable way. If there was ever a time in history where you would say, you know, clearly God has abandoned us, so we are going to abandon him. It would have been that time. But what happened instead is that people didn't th see that God had abandoned them. They saw that Jesus was there with them. I tell the story of Catherine of Siena, for example, and she was asked, why did you flee toward the people who were suffering the plague rather than away from them? And yeah. she said, you know, I want to be with Jesus. And Jesus is with the suffering. So if I want to be with Jesus, I go to the mm. suffering because that's where Jesus is. That wasn't just her personal conviction. That became the way the church operated. And when civil governments collapsed, the church stepped in. 
helped create the idea of the quarantine, which, by the way, was based on the 40 days, uh, uh, 40 days of isolation of Jesus and others in Scripture. It, they created the whole idea of sanitation, uh, bringing back dietary laws, of creating hospitals to help treat the sick, creating wellness programs to help well people stay well. All of those things mm -hmm. came out of the fundamental belief that you go where Jesus is if you want to be with Jesus, and Jesus is with the suffering. Yeah, great, great uh, way to close this. I can tell you that uh, I, I get a lot of people who will write books. That we're in a book writing season, it seems like, and there's always a quick quarter, and you know all the people, we know, all the, so know the same people. And so books come out, and, and I don't typically, though, will do shows about books. I've done a few, but not often. And this is one of those that I just want to encourage everyone who's listening to go out and get it because there's no way for us to really cover some of the stuff that we're going to cover right now. There's no way for us to really even talk about it in the kind of detail that you can get in a book. Books are important because we can talk about things in podcasts, but you can only deep dive if you're willing to read. This book is called Truth Changes Everything. The subtitle is How People of Faith Can Transform the World in Times of Crisis. If ever there was a time of crisis, it's now. So let me encourage you to get Jeff's new book. Jeff, where can they go? Look, I know all the booksellers are out there, but is there a special place you'd like to send people? Number one, first, to learn more about you. Then number two, to, to be able to purchase this book. Well, to, you can learn more about my work at summit.org. You can also get the book there, but it is helpful if people order the book from Amazon. You know how that works. It's this huge, it's the biggest bookseller that there is. If you buy the book from Amazon, they move it up in their algorithms and show it to more people. So if you want to buy the book in a way that actually helps you help other people, that might be the way to do it. It's, they don't need our money, but they do help us get the word out. No, that's a good point. I want to encourage people the same way. And people will come write to me all the time and say, why would you advance? Like, even after a podcast like this, I'm sure I'm going to get a couple of emails. Why would you guys advance Amazon? It's not because we are uh, we love Amazon strategy or who, who the company is. It's not that at all. I wouldn't care who the company is, but it turns out that this is where you folks are going to buy books. And because we want the word out to others, even people who are not Christians, this is the place to buy books that changes the and people see yeah this is a and already Jeff is already a bet's already on the best sellers list already it made the first top 100 books within the first day I noticed today is second day day two it's in the top 50 in several categories so this is really on the climb I would encourage everyone to go get truth changes everything thank you Jeff for coming on the show I appreciate you Jim appreciate that and thank you for being a champion for truth. To hear more from Jay Warner Wallace, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For more information on this week's topic, visit youtube.com slash coldcasechristianity with Jay Warner Wallace. Thank you for joining us on this Cold Case Christianity broadcast.